right. We saved the best for last. I'm so excited. I know I say that all the time. I'll keep saying it. God is good. I, all, and all the time. That's right. You ladies, see, y'all, did, y'all ate lunch, and normally after lunch you get sleepy. Y'all are not sleepy at all. I love it. Y'all are, <laughs> hallelujah. That's right. <laughs> I know. (laughs) Amen. Woo. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to be in some, open up your Bible. I'll be like my daddy and tell you, anywhere, it's all good. (laughs) But we're going to be in John chapter 1. John chapter 1. The beginning of this year, uh, Actually, probably the end, a little bit at the end of 2022, and then through 2023, beginning of this year, God has just been, there's a, there's a common theme the Lord was trying to show me and teach me in these first four chapters of John. And we're going to, this, this last session, we've, you know, we've, we've, we've drawn near to God. We know whose we are now. It's not who we are anymore. It's whose, Right? It's whose we are. That's a little weird English, but it's okay to say that because that's King James Version. So, but it's good for me to draw near to God. We've, gone, we've drawn near to God by going through his temple. Everything points to who? Jesus. Everything points to Jesus. We saw Catherine. She is the temple, that, just that beautiful picture of seeing a person that has called on Jesus to save her. She is now the temple of the Holy Ghost that dwells in her. She has been bought with a price. She is not defined by who she is. She's defined by whose she is. So now we've got drawn near to God. We've we've established uh, that foundation in the temple. Now we've, we've, we've talked about how we can trust him because you can't trust somebody you don't know. Romans 10, 17 says, but without it, with by faith comes by what? Hearing and hearing by the Y'all, listen, y'all know the word? That is beautiful. The, hearing by the word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But I've got to position myself to hear him. So we're going to come daily seeking his face. We're going to come daily drawing to him. It's every day. It's not a one and done. It's every day drawing near to God and he will draw near to you. So here you have, and then you've got, you've, you've, we've drawn near, we've, we've talked about, we've given testimony of what he's done. I've shared with you all the things. I am the person I am today, not because of me. It's because of Jesus. It's because of what he has done. I am what I am because of the grace of God. So I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare, we gotta tell somebody. The redeemed of the Lord say so. So we're not just saying so. We're telling him what he's done. We want to tell everybody what Jesus has done. Not just the gospel of salvation. We tell them that Jesus died for them, that he, he loves them, that he redeems them, but that it's not just a one and done, I'll see you when you get here, good luck, but that he, is, um, he sticks closer than a brother. He is, never leaves me and he never forsakes me. Let me tell you what he's done. Let me tell you I went through this and I went... Every one of you in here could come up here and give testimony of what God has done for you if you've been with him at least a minute. What he has done for you in your life. And if all you have is salvation, then that's enough. That's enough to tell. That's enough to tell. So, we're going to go through this journey again. We've gone through the journey of the temple. We're going to continue to go through this journey. So, I... I I love John 1. It's probably my, my favorite because when I ask people, when people ask me, Angela, where should I start reading the Bible? Well, the Bible tells us where to start reading. In the beginning. Start in the beginning. So in the beginning was the word. Start anywhere. But I love John 1, 1 because it tells us where to start. In the beginning was the word. And it's capitalized. It's capitalized. D- big W, right? That means it's a name. It's a name, it's a who. And the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In in him was life, and the life 
was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Verse 14. And the word became, and the word was made flesh, and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Wow. Jesus. The word became flesh. His name is Jesus. So, John chapter 1. Hi, my name's Jesus. It's as if he comes in, the man of God, the God-man, and he walks in to you, and, and he wrecks your world, and he introduces himself to you. Hi, my name's Jesus, John 1. I came for you. I love you. I want you. You. Song of Solomon 710 says, I, my beloved, and his desire is toward me. That word desire in the Hebrew, it means a strong feeling of want. In fact, so strong that it's as strong as death. Song of Solomon chapter 8, that last part of that chapter, it says, set me as a seal upon thine heart. For love is as cruel as death and the grave. If you were to put love in a house, it has a most vehement flame that the house would be utterly condemned. Well, guess what house we are now? And guess who's the consuming fire? Who condemned this house? Condemned this outer man. I don't want this outer man to live. I want the inner man to consume everything, annihilate me. Jeremiah 23, 29 says, Is not my word like as a fire and a hammer that breaketh the rocks into pieces? You got a hard heart? Has this weekend not done nothing for you? You're just like, mm, I'm just here because I ain't got nothing better to do. I don't know. <laughs> Get into the word. The word is like, like as a fire and a hammer. Break up this heart. Break it up. Consume me. Turn everything that I am that is of this flesh, that is of my, my old man, turn it to ash. Blow, Holy Spirit, blow it out. Burn in me. Hey, guess what? You don't have to promote a forest fire. Can you imagine... Just imagine with me for just one second. If we talked about that cup, right? The vessel, these houses, these temples that are filled with the Holy Ghost. Mind you, it's not like it's compartmentalized. He is, and he dwells in you. We realize now the very presence of God dwells in us. Wow, that should, we could stop right there and just go home. But he wants to do so. You were made for more. Can you imagine with me for just a second if every single one of you that has called on Jesus to save you, you have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you. If you, when you came together corporately as one body, so full, so filled, you, you surrendered everything, your thoughts, your life, you, you said, God, clean me up. I want to be holy because your word tells me, be you holy for I am holy. I want to come closer to you. I don't want my mind or the, the world to dictate my emotions. I want to be, I want your word to, to dictate my emotions. I want to be, I want to be designed. I want to be, be, I want the potter to mold this clay. I want you to burn in me. I want you to fillet me wide open and expose anything in my life because guess what? The word is also like as a, it's like a sword. So if the word of God is all these things and the word is Jesus, when you draw near to him, honey, you're not just drawing near to your savior. You're drawing near to, to the man that is like a, as a sword that cuts your life open and exposes the intent and the reasons why you even come to church. He exposes the intent of your hearts. He discerns it with his word. He discerns it when you come close to his word. You're like, wow, God, am I doing this for you? Or am I doing it for me? 
Am I doing ministry for me or for you? Lord, may we only have an audience of one. May it only be that we are looking to him, the author and finisher of our faith, that we want only to please Jesus. But can you imagine if we all came in here tomorrow morning so full, what would happen? Oh, a glory cloud might just walk up in here, just hover, and all the men be like, what is going on? What happened to my wife? What happened to these women? They're so excited and they're so, ze- they're so zealous for Jesus. Hey, that's what turned the world upside down. It was Christ in the disciples. It was Christ in them, the word of God. The word of God is what changes lives. It's Jesus. He changes us. He feeds us. He waters us. He nurtures us. He teaches us. And it all comes from this. Again, I can't have the mind of Christ, which he's telling me to have, if I'm not, I don't know what's on his mind. I don't know how to fight the enemy because our weapons are not carnal to the pulling down of strongholds, but they're mighty. They're the, they're war, our warfare is spiritual. So we fight with spiritual weapons, not with carnal weapons. How do you fight? The word of God in prayer. The word of God in prayer. I need thee every hour. Oh, God, I need thee every hour. Because my flesh, we're battling two things, the enemy and our flesh. That's two things. Jesus is like, it's your opportunity. It's your opportunity to be obedient to me. Eyes on me. Be fixed on me, on my face. So, John 1, he introduces himself. Hi, my name's Jesus. I came for you. I want you. There's a common theme here. John chapter 2 records the very first miracle of Jesus. John chapter 2 records the very first miracle of Jesus. He turned what? Water into wine at a what? A wedding. He turned water into wine at a wedding. He could have done anything and picked any place to perform his first miracle, but he chose a wedding. I don't think that's a mistake. I think that God is detailed. And I think that words matter in Scripture because we've already established who's the word. So it's not this willy-nilly thing. You know, he just decided to put a bunch of words together and say, here, here's the Bible, good luck. No. (laughs) Everything in here has a purpose. Everything in here is going to accomplish itself. So there's a theme here. Hi, my name's Jesus. I'm I'm the son of God. I come to take your sins and put them on me. I'm going to live a perfect and sinless life for you and for me. So again, John chapter 2 was at a wedding. I don't think it's a coincidence. And it's safe to say that our Jesus had a wedding on his mind. I just believe he did. And we're going to keep going for this thing. We're going to keep looking toward it. So we're getting to know about him. We're getting to know his character because he's performing miracles and his values and the things that he was doing. He was coming to break religious traditions. He was coming to break religious traditions. After his first miracle, Jesus enters the temple. And what happens? We talked about it last night. Thou hast made my house a den of thieves. My house shall be called the house of, and that just screams relationship. I came to die for the church. I came to die for you. My house shall be called the house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. So here we are. We're we're falling in love with him. He's showing us. And so at the at. Towards John chapter 3, we're, we're walking into John 3. Are y'all following along? Y'all, are y'all with me? Okay, we're, I'm about to get into the, the, this is just introduction. Oh my goodness. <laughs> okay, so John chapter 3 starts off with a conversation with Nicodemus, right? You must be born again. Nicodemus says, how can that happen? I can't, I'm too big now. I can't go, you know, I can't be born twice. And he didn't say that's not what he was talking about, right? We know this now. And then he 
he says, when I, but when I started to see the theme here, Jesus was opening up my eyes that I could behold this. He compared it to who I was. I began to think there was no way I could approach him. There was no way I would be someone he would want to look at, let alone that he wanted a relationship with me. But right on cue, anticipating these hesitations that would come, Jesus tells us all that is required to have a relationship with him. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I love Hosea. Hosea is one of my favorite books. In Hosea 2, 19 and 20, it says, I will betroth thee unto me forever, yea, I will betroth unto me in righteousness and in judgment and in loving kindness and in mercies. I will even betroth thee unto me in faithfulness, and thou shalt know the Lord. That word know in the word of God is not American English, we have dimmed down words. We have. We've made it whatever we want to make it now. But according to the word of God, when you use the word know, K-N-O-W, it is implying a very intimate relationship. So let's put that in our back pocket, all right? It's implying when you read that, the word know, it's the same as in Genesis, when Adam knew Eve and she bore a son, intimate relationship, intimate. God wants to you, for you to know him, implying a very intimate relationship. So we put that in our back pockets. Y'all ready? All right, strap on your seatbelts. All right, so John 3. Here we have John 1, Jesus steps on the scene. Hi, my name's Jesus. He introduces himself to us. All right, he's the word of God. John chapter 2, again, the wedding, a miracle. Could have been anywhere, but he chose a wedding. John chapter 3 ends <laughs> with something so amazing. Here you have John the Baptist. You know, he was the one that was preparing the way for the Lord, Right? John the Baptist is preparing the way for the Lord, and it says, <clears throat> well, hang on a second. Here we go. John 3, 29. John 3, 29. John the Baptist, he could have called him Jesus. He could have called him the Savior of the world. He could have called him the Messiah. He could have called him the one to come, the great I am, the beginning, the word. He could have said any one of those, and he would have been correct. But he says a very specific name. Let y'all read it with me. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, Rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This, my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. He called him the bridegroom. Wow. Y'all are like, okay, what's the deal? <laughs> well, to better understand these truths of John chapter 4, God brought me to, I was reading the Bible through this last year, and, and he was showing me some things. Because, you know, this is the end of John 3. The bridegroom. John the Baptist is saying, this is the guy. The bridegroom. Y'all aren't as excited as I thought you were going to be. <laughs> You're like, well, tell us more, Angela. Maybe we will. So this is so incredible. Oh, my word. I love that God's word can explain God's word, don't you? Like, you, it's all profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, that the man of God may be thoroughly furnished into all good works, that we would be righteous and live holy and upright lives. Like, his word, that word furnished, like, he's what, you know, there's some songs out there, and I'll, I was sharing with a friend that say, you know, we'll make room for you. No, no, we ain't just making room. You come and you take over. I ain't going to put you in the, in the bathroom or the closet. Like, you can have all this. Annihilate me. Annihilate my flesh. 
fillet me open with your sword. Cut away the things in my life that, are, are, that I have taken over. God, that's the beauty of God. When you get near him, his light exposes that. And there's just a natural confession in his presence. And all he does is he says, give it to me. And he gives you something far greater. Because anytime you lay that confession at his feet and you confess your fault there, righteousness, that he, confession is made known unto righteousness. He, he walks in that other part of that and furnishes that part of your vessel, of your temple. And before you know it, you're like, that don't bother me no more. I'm not, that sin don't easily beset me no more. It does, it, I, that used to bother me. It don't no more. I, I'm, I've been set free from that because Jesus is taking over that. He's furnishing that part of me. So may he furnish all of us, all the parts, not just some, all of it. So here we are. As I go through this, these, these books and I'm reading, I'm reading the Bible through and I'm in Genesis at the time. I'm in Genesis chapter 24, Genesis 25, 6, 7, 8, 9, 29. I get to 29. And I'm, I'm, I'm looking at this thing in Genesis 24, 10 through 27. I want you all to write this down. We don't, we're not going to go into it right now. Genesis 24, 10 through 27. In your quiet time at home, I'm going to give you three passages. Again, Genesis 24, 10 through 27. Genesis 29, 1 through 18. And Exodus 2, 15 through 22. So we've established that there's a wedding thing going on. These first four chapters that I never saw. Or the first three chapters. And as I'm, I'm, I know what I'm about to come up on because John 4 was where the Lord brought me to himself. If you knew, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is talking to you. There's that word, no, new, K-N-E-W. There it is. If you had an intimate relationship with me, Angela, you wouldn't be saying that. You wouldn't be saying, is this all what life has to offer me? Is this all that there is? No, you would be fulfilled in me. So as I read him, I'm in John 1, 2, 3, and in Genesis. I get to John 3, I see about the, talking about the bridegroom. Wow, it's amazing. And then I knew what was about to come up, the woman at the well. The woman at the well. Wells are the symbolic meaning for the well in the Hebrew is life-giving creation and new beginnings. New beginnings. That's what a well means. Not oh well, no, a well, like where you draw water from. So typical history in the Hebrew shows us that wells were places of betrothal scenes. So back in the heat, you know, obviously that was where the women gathered, right? So the guys would be like observing in the background. Oh, look, she would be a good wife. She would be a good wife. So the time of day that they would go would be early in the morning or, you know, in the evening where it was cooler, right? So that, that was when they would go and draw, the women would go to the well and they would draw the water out of the well. They would all be there. So John's four, John 4's well it's not just any well. It's not just any well. This was Jacob's well, right? So in Genesis 29, at, by the way, when you go read that, the verses 1 through 18, it'll say that it was at a time of the day, which was at the same exact time of day, that Jesus met the woman at the well. So Jacob met his wife, his betrothed wife, Rachel, at the same exact time of day that Jesus must needs go through Samaria because he's got an appointment. And it's, it's about to be noontime. And hey, guess what? He was from the beginning. Do you think that he knew what was going on at Jacob's well when Jacob met Rachel at, the, at noontime? When Jacob met Rachel... You best believe he knew what was going on. He's coming to break traditions. He's coming to break religious traditions. He's showing up at a well to betroth a woman who, by the way, is nameless. 
because I believe we could put our name there. To betroth her, a Samaritan, ancestral enemies of the Jew. She was a stranger, a Gentile. She was not, she was not, she, the and Jews hated the Samaritans. They, she, they didn't have anything to do with Samaritans. In fact, the disciples were so, they didn't know what was going, why are we going through? They always go around. They go the long way. You know, when you're at the grocery store and you see that girl and you're like, oh my God. And you see me, because I'll be like, oh, hey. Oh, here she comes. Go, hurry. You're going to be talking to her forever. They would do that. They hated them. They didn't want to go through. Jesus said, mm, we have an, I have an appointment. We got to be there at noon because I, I, it's important. I'm coming to break that tradition. I'm coming to change it. I'm coming to fulfill it. Coming to fulfill this law. So here he is waiting for her. Sitting at the well. Here she comes to draw. He begins to speak to her. Y'all know the rest of the story. The beauty of it is that she begins to say, why are you talking to me? Why are you talking to me? Let's turn to it. John chapter 4. John chapter 4, starting in verse 10. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that say to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well, and drank thereof himself? And his children and his cattle, Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water, springing up into ever everlasting life. The woman said unto him, Sir, give me this water, that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus saith unto her, mm, Go call your husband and come hither. Well, that came out of the blue. Right? We're talking about water, not my husband. Like, I don't even come during the time of day where, because all the other women are here, and I'm not that kind of woman, and I'm this kind of woman. Mm. But see, the beauty of God, of Jesus, he is the word. And remember, Jeremiah 23, he is like a, a fire and like as a hammer. So in order for us to put water Onto, if I were to put water onto a hard ground, what would happen to the water? It would evaporate, right? So there has to be an aeration of the soil so the water can get into the soil. So this Jesus, and that word aerate means expose. So Jesus wants to give her this water. He wants to give her this beauty, this potent, powerful, holy, wonderful, life-changing water. But you can't put that kind of water on a hard surface. There's got to be an exposure to the light, to the air. So, hence, go call your husband. He prompts a confession. He prompts her and gives her an open door to confess to Jesus, I have no husband. Thou hast told the truth. For you have had five husbands, and the one that you are with now is not your husband. Oh, what does she say? Let's go to it. It's so good. Okay. Verse 19. The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. You know, she's reminding him, all oh, the Jews, right? Jesus said to her, verse 21, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when you shall neither in this mountain nor yet in Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. <laughs> Don't you love the butts of the Bible? Well, my favorite butt of the Bible 
is right here, verse 23. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Right? What is truth? We've already established that. John 17, 17. His word. God has given you his Holy Spirit. Spirit, truth. He dwells in you. It's as if he was saying, we know what we worship, but honey, salvation is not just for the Jews anymore. That's why I'm here at this well, at this time of day, the same time of day that Jacob met Rachel, his wife, and was betrothed to her in Genesis 24. And over and over, Genesis 29, Abraham sent a servant, remember? He sent a servant to go find a wife for his son Isaac, which is a beautiful picture of God. God sending his son to die for a bride, to betroth you to himself. He wants you. He desires you. He, he, he didn't have to get on one knee, because guess what? He got himself up on a cross, was torn. He didn't have to give us no two-carat diamond ring. He gave us something better. He gave us the Holy Spirit to seal the betrothed, to seal because he knows those that are his, and he's coming back for you. He's coming back for what is his. He is coming back for what he has bought, what, he ha what you have accepted. So there is such a beauty in this because we don't worship. We don't have to go to a temple once a year anymore. We have the Holy Spirit dwelling in these temples. We get to talk to him, have this relationship with him, the Holy Spirit. It's way better than a two-carat diamond ring, way better. And he didn't have to go on his knee and ask, for a, ask, to be, ha, ask our hand in marriage. He nailed himself to a cross. Well, the beauty of this time of, of year, of this, this time of, of John 1, 2, 3, and 4, that the way that they did their traditional weddings was a Galilean wedding. And Jesus knew that. So he would speak in parables. So he would explain the spiritually, what it would be like as, okay? So we're going to go through the Galilean wedding and use, have the scripture, have the word of God define these moments that are coming up. And ladies, the word of God says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 28, and now little children, abide in him that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. I'm ready every day. My lamps are burning. I've, I've met with Jesus. I've, I, I'm ready. So we're going to go through this. Are y'all ready? I'm so excited. Ah, this is so exciting. All right, let me get to my notes because these are all crazy. All right, the Galilean wedding. The word of God says in John chapter 6, 57. John chapter 6, 57. Over and over and over, the Father, Jesus would always say, the Father hath sent me. The Father hath sent me, right? You read in the Gospels, you hear the word, the, the, the betrothal, the Father in a Galilean wedding would send the groom to the bride's house to propose. Will you be mine? John chapter 1, hi, my name's Jesus. Will you be mine? Will you be mine? He would have written a covenant called the ketubah, which is a binding marriage contract. All right? This, bi this ketubah, the binding agreement, would testify how he would care for his bride 
what he would do for her, what he would give for her, how he would protect her, a price to be paid, a covenant, a binding agreement that no man could change. (laughs) Now, the enemy would try to. But here he is. John 6, 54 through 58, again, over and over, Jesus would say, the living Father hath sent me. The Father in the Galilean wedding would send the groom to the bride's house. Next step, next step. They would come under the canopy of what is called the hoppa, the hoppa, 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 I don't know, I'm not Hebrew. And Song of Solomon chapter 2, verses 3 through 4 says, as the apple tree among the trees of the wood So is my beloved among the sons. I sat down under his shadow with great delight, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. He brought me to the banqueting house, and his banner over me was love. His banner over me was love. So they would come under the Galilean wedding. They would come under this canopy, which is called the hoopah. The next step, who this is, I think this was my favorite. They would, the, there would be a cup, <laughs> a cup, y'all, a cup. Come on now, John 4, hello. You think this is a coincidence? No. Song of Solomon 8, 6 through 7 says, again, I, I quoted a little bit ago, says, set me as a seal upon thine heart, as a seal upon thine arm. For love is strong as death, jealousy is cruel as the grave. The coals thereof are coals of fire, which hath a most vehement flame. Many waters cannot quench love. 2 Timothy 2.19 says, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. So at this cup ceremony, he then would take this, he would have a cup of wine, the groom. The groom would have a cup of wine. And he would pass the cup to the bride. And if she accepted it and drank of the cup, they were considered husband and wife. They were considered engaged or betrothed to one another. So, and nothing could sever that. Nothing could sever that. Okay, so here you are, they, they passed the cup, Luke twenty two twenty. 20, Jesus said, likewise also the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. Will you accept my gift? My gift of salvation. I want you. I want you to be mine. I died for you. Will you be mine? Accept the cup. Here's the thing. She could refuse it. She didn't have to take the cup. She didn't have to take the cup that was extended to her. He was waiting with anticipation. Please take the cup. I love you. I died for you. She could reject it and say no and walk away and walk away. But here they, are, here they are, Ephesians 4.30. Once she did accept the cup, she was sealed. Sealed. <clears throat> Ephesians 4.30 says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Ephesians 1.13 says, In whom ye also trusted. After that, you heard the word of truth, The gospel of your salvation in whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. He promised himself to you. And by you accepting the cup, you have promised yourself to him. I am my beloved's and he is mine. Everything that he is, we get to have everything. He has given us everything that he is. Everything. The next step is they are now considered betrothed and committed only to one another. Only to one another. 
Song of Solomon, chapter 6, verse 3 says, I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. He feedeth among the lilies. Again, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and ye are not your own. You're his. So it's not who you are, it's whose you are. For you are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now after they would, she would drink from this, from this cup, and now they've been, they're, they're together, they're considered engaged, what we call engaged. They're betrothed to one another. There's a preparation that happens. So the groom, this is amazing, the groom would then leave his bride and return back to his father's house. Both now considered husband and wife, committed to each other. But before he leaves, before the groom leaves in the Galilean wedding, he leaves her, he leaves the bride what is called gifts of love. Gifts of love. So she's not left empty-handed. She's not left empty-handed. These gifts of love are for a specific thing. They, these gifts of love are for a specific thing. It's for her preparation for the big wedding day. This preparation for her to prepare herself. So he has given her these gifts so that she could take them to back with her maidens, her maidens that her bridesmaids, to help her prepare for that day, for that wedding day. Amazing, amazing. So here she is. Guess what? Jesus has left us gifts. He has given us, number one, he's given us the forgiveness of sins, eternal life, and he gives us the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. And access, with, by his blood, we have access to the Father. Even the matchmaker, the Holy Spirit, convicts the world of sin. He leads us into the truth every day. The Word of God says, 1 Peter 1, 16, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Every day we're coming in that preparation. You read those verses in the New Testament that Paul wrote and Peter wrote in the book of, a handbook on humility and Peter and, and 1 Peter and 2 Peter. And it's all of these things that prepare us. Awake out of sleep. Wake up. We don't know the day or the hour. We don't know. Guess what? Jesus doesn't either. Only the Father knows. Only the Father knows when to go get his bride. So here you have, he goes to prepare. The, the, the son would go back to his father's house to prepare a place for the husband and the wife. To prepare a place for themselves. So John 14, 2 through 3, it says, In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go. These are words of Jesus. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again. And receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Oh, that's good. That is good. In the meantime, the bride would make herself ready. Revelation 21, verse 2. She is prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Whew. Isaiah 61, 10 says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord, my soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. Oh, he has given us all the gifts of love that we need to prepare ourselves for that day. The father was the only one in the Galilean wedding. He was the only one that knew the day. Matthew 24, 34 through 42. But of the day and hour, verse 36, we'll just read. But of the day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my father only. The, we're getting to the last, right? We're almost there. 
the bride, once the, the, she's getting herself ready, she's making herself ready for her, because today could be the day. She would wake up in the morning. She'd be like, okay, let's get our stuff. We got to get ready. We got to get, we got to get the gifts of love. We got to prepare ourselves. We got to make sure I've got my, my, my dress has to be just right. Everything has to be just right. My hair, my makeup, all the stuff. Now that's not how spiritually we get ready. We get ready by how? In the morning when I rise, give me Jesus. In the morning when I rise, give me Jesus. When I am alone, give me Jesus. And when I come to die, give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. I just want Jesus. So we're preparing. Right now we're in the preparation stage. We've been given the gifts of love. We've accepted his gift. We've drank of the cup. We've accepted. We're engaged. We're betrothed to him. We're committed to him. We're sealed by the Holy Spirit. He knows who we are. And he's given us the gifts of love to prepare for that day. Because it could be any day. And the way that the signs of the times are right now, it could be, it could be right now. Are you ready? Are you ready? <laughs> I want to be ready. I don't want to be asleep. Because all the times that I have sat at his feet here on this planet, when I lock eyes with the one who I met with on this earth, it's going to be worth it. It's going to be worth it, ladies. Because he is worth it. He is worthy of it all. So we're preparing John 16, 13 through 15 says, How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he, hath re he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine, therefore said I, that he shall take a mine and shall show it unto you. Praise the Lord. Romans 8, 26 through 27. He intercedes. <clears throat> he gives us the supply, these gifts of love. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Galatians 5.22 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. He's given us all the things to be equipped and prepared for that day. We are without excuse. Without excuse. 1 John 2, again, 28 says, And now little children abide in him. When he, that trumpet sounds, and God says, go get your bride. And that, the sky splits and the trumpet sounds and the dead in Christ arise and we which are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds. Wow. Are y'all ready? Are you ready? Mm. So, the groom did not know again. He did not know when the day would be. But when the father says it's time, then the groom would retur return. And it would be a surprise wedding. His friends in the Galilean wedding, on his way to meet his bride, would blow a trumpet, or what they call a shofar, or I think that's something like that, and call out, the bridegroom cometh! The bridegroom cometh! <laughs> 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 57. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, 
at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must be put, put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on immortality, so when this corruptible shall, shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> wow. Isaiah 26, 20 and 21. Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers and shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment, until the indignation be overpassed. For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. That's happening. Do you know him? Do you know him? Enter into your chambers and get to know him. That inner place, that inner chamber, that closet, that prayer closet. He's given you all the gifts of love to know him. To have a very intimate relationship with the one that you have been betrothed to. He wants you. He doesn't want to just save you. He, and save you in, so that you don't have to go to hell. <laughs> he wants to spend time with you here and now. He loves you here and now. Whew. Revelations 4.1. After this I looked and behold a door was open in heaven. And the first vo voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me. Which said come up hither and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. The bride. What's amazing to me is that once that they, brought, they came to her. They would, the bride would be lifted up. They would put her on this little carriage. And they would, they would hoist her up. They would pick her up over their heads. Y'all, come on. Rapture. Let's do this. Oh, it all is a picture. First Thessalonians, again, we've already read it. He shall descend from heaven. Then the, the, we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. We'll be lifted up. So the bride, they would go to the bride's house. They'd cry out, the, the bridegroom cometh, they would lift her up, the bridegroom and the bride would then be together in the space of seven days. After that was ended, in the space of those seven days, a public introduction of the bride and a feast. Wow. The marriage supper of the Lamb. Are y'all ready? Are y'all ready? Now this is after the judgment seat of Christ. Right? So we're all going to have to go to the judgment. What you did with the name of Jesus. What you did with all of the gifts that he gave you while you were here on this earth. What he did for you. Revelation 19, 7 through 9. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. John saw the future. He saw he wrote it. It's all right here. It hadn't happened yet, but it's going to happen. It's going to happen. Are you ready? Are you ready? Let's enter into that inner chamber and spend time with the one who didn't take a knee, but took a cross. And he bled and he died for you. Because in John 1, he said, Hi, my name's Jesus. John 2, 
he turned water into wine at a wedding. John 3, he called himself the bridegroom. John 4, he came to break religious traditions that salvation and getting to know him, the gift of God, is not just for the Jews anymore. It's for you. Salvation is for you now too. So let's not take it for granted. You've been saved. You've called on Jesus to save you. You, 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 said, you said that. You believed in your heart that Jesus died. He rose again and he is seated at the right hand of the throne of the Father. Now you get to grow in that grace. You get to grow in that relationship with him, with the gifts of love that he has given you to prepare yourself because the Father is soon going to say, go get your bride. Are you ready? Are you ready? I, I hope I'm ready. I want to be ready. I'm going to ask Catherine, if we have someone to sing. She's going to play. All right, we're going to do something a little bit different. The Lord laid it on my heart this morning early, early, way early. Y'all, he does this. Like, mm, I'm not going to even tell you all the time. But I just want us to get in groups. I want us to take a time, and I know we've had our groups in, in, our, in our discussion in here, and that was awesome. I enjoyed just being at the table with, with my sisters and hearing their heart. But you're, you're sitting with your, with your, your friends, your, your family, your sisters, and I just want us to play this music and just spend time praying out loud together to the Father. Because the Word of God says it's good to confess your faults one toward another. And pray ye one for another. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. You, you, you will be healed in that. Not just in maybe your physical, that you not, might need a, a physical healing, but a spiritual healing. That maybe you need to confess with a, with a friend that, you know, I haven't been spending time with him the way I should. And as the body of Christ, I don't want it to be my sin that stunts your growth. Because our sin doesn't just affect us. We are knitted together by the Holy Spirit. We're a part of a body. If I sin, y'all going to be affected by it. I'm pretty sure that's how they felt when they, they threw old what's-his-name over and he got swallowed up by a whale. There's his, Jonah's sin didn't just affect Jonah. It affected everybody in the boat. So here we are. We're all up in this boat. And we're just going to spend time with one another at the feet of Jesus for just a minute. So praying, getting groups. Y'all can spread out over here. You can come out over here and just get in a couple, get two or three, two or three or four, or however many. Just pray with one another. We're, gonna, we're, we're not going to leave the same that we came here today. I know I don't want to leave the same. God wants to change us from glory to glory. He has given us such a gift such a gift of his Holy Spirit and his word and sisters <laughs> and y'all we're coming in tomorrow Sunday morning and we is we rocking this house <laughs> the men ain't gonna know what happened but we met with Jesus we're ignorant and unlearned but we've been with Jesus amen let's get into groups
ladies finish up, I just want to thank you for Angela, for her love, for her love for you, Lord, for the commitment that she made to prepare to bring to us what God had for her today, Lord. I pray that as we go out and leave these doors, may we not leave what we've learned. May we not just put it on the shelf, God, but may we draw closer to you. May we follow you, worship you, but most importantly, Lord, it's time for us to declare you, God. The time is short. Things are not good, God, and it's our turn. It's our time to rise up and to share what God has showed us, Lord. Thank you for this church. Thank you for the pastors, Lord. I pray that you just watch over each and every one of us as we go home. Give us a good night's rest and help us, Lord, to come back refreshed and ready to hear what God has for us. And I thank you for all that's been done this weekend. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, the last time you had to hear from me this weekend, okay?